Thank you for sticking with us uh, so long today. I feel like we've learned a lot. Um, I want to take a quick minute to introduce the panel for this session. Uh, it's Public Places, Parks, and Assets. And so uh, we have Councilman Boudreau here, Ken Boudreau from District um, 4, and also David Jeremy from here from Millionville and the Bayou District. Can we give David and Millicent and Mikey and their whole team a big round of applause for today? Director of the Library System, Teresa Elverson, here too, also. Um, so they're going to give us a <laughs> They're going to give a nice little overview of a lot of our our um, public assets. Um, you know, a big piece of this, um, Charles talked about it, but a big part of Create is understanding what our assets are already and doing a really thorough inventory of that as we prepare to kind of figure out what we need and want as a community. So that's kind of the purpose of the session. I'm going to turn it over to Councilman Pedro. Thank you so much, and good afternoon to each and every one of you who's here. Uh, I want to say how honored I am to be serving on this panel and moderating this panel with uh, two individuals I find to be really good friends, someone who I've enjoyed working with over the last, um, I guess, 10 or so years, both Teresa and David. And, and I hope that what we share with you today is of great benefit and very informative and hope to really get to an engaging conversation with each and every one of you. Um, I'm going to handle the parks aspect of it. You've already met uh, the panel. Uh, Kate has got kind of got ahead of us. I, I was looking forward to introducing them, but she done stole that thunder. So we'll get right into it. And then um, basically we're going to follow the similar format of the day. Um, we'll each do a, a little presentation of, of, a, of a particular discipline or set and then we'll open up the entirety to uh, question and answer. So um, as it relates to assets available through Parks and Recreation, um, of course, there's another Boudreaux guy who actually run the Parks and Recreation Department here in Lafayette that I know just so happened to be my brother Gerald. And um, uh, under Mr. Ernie's neighbors, uh, back in the 80s, I actually had the great fortune of working in that department and running some rec centers. So just a quick overview, the Parks Department consists of a number of uh, properties and assets. We have recreational centers, we have of course outdoor parks, there are uh, both indoor and outdoor swimming pools, tennis facilities, golf facilities, offer a number of organized activities, uh, everything from leagues, different forms of leagues for adults and children alike, classes and workshops. Um, also a very, very successful and robust summer camp, um, including for therapeutic services where our special population um, and those with certain disabilities have special services available to them. We also operate a campsite, a um, Canadiana Park campsite, where um, individuals coming into town have the opportunity to go um, and plug in, enjoy a beautiful park, and camp out while visiting uh, Lafayette or any of our surrounding municipalities. And, and sport complexes like the Neyland Park and the uh, Brown Park and other sport complexes um, that we utilize for different sporting events. So the interesting thing for me, when, when Mayor President Robindo first started talking about CREATE, and of course being chairman of the council, we had the opportunity to sit and discuss some of these uh, initial and preliminary plans. For me, CREATE, prior to the creation of CREATE, CREATE would be recreation. Just if you just look at it, everything that CREATE offers, the culture, of course, uh, recreation, I talked about our campsites, I talked about our outdoor activities, I talked about uh, the nature station and things of that nature. So the culture was there, of course, the recreation and all activities along with it, the entertainment, the ability for families to go and watch young kids um, be entertained by their Little League bloopers and, and also performances and events in our recreational facilities. So the entertainment component is there. Uh, the arts, been partnering with the arts, um, dating back to PASA and so many other arts organizations in our summer camps. And even during the course of the year, where instructors that was contracted would come into the centers and teach classes before places like, thank God, before places like the Acadiana Center for the Arts existed and those types of things. So the arts have actually been there offering dance, 
I remember we had a breakthrough at the Domain Recreational Center. And if you don't know much about it, it's named after Mickey Domain right there on Mud Avenue. was servicing about 100% minority population. And I converted a racquetball court that was getting little utilization. And I went find me a dance teacher um, who taught tap and point and ballet. I put mirrors up against the wall. I put a, a guide rail up. And we was actually teaching classical dance from a recreational perspective because we know dance could be pretty expensive, right? So when we talk about the arts, the arts has actually been there, tourism, and of course our economy. So before we created Create, it was recreation. With all of that, there are some, some concerns, there are some hardships, that there are some barriers that we still have to overcome. There are a number of programming services out there, but, but our greatest challenge is still funding. We know that here in Lafayette, we operate under a millage that is not sufficient to cover all costs, so we still depend upon the general fund. I personally believe that Lafayette has been primed and ready to step up to the plate and fully fund recreation, but the powers that be, uh, we just haven't had the, the numbers for people to say that T word, right? To just say, look, you got to literally pay to play, right? So, uh, but I think that we will come a time and I think Create will deliver that to us where we can fully fund those types of activities. Um, so, I think our greatest asset is our volunteers. Like in any and all instances, uh, recreation is known to have some of the greatest volunteers. And if you could just imagine, just about every coach that you see, whether it's literally football, baseball, bitty basketball, that's a volunteer. Most of the instructors in the centers, those are volunteers. Those who serve on the commission are volunteers. So that would certainly be considered our strongest asset. So when you couple all of that together, I see this future. I see this future that's tied into this CREATE initiative. And I think that future says about recreation, that recreational component under CREATE that we must expand services, we must have uh, and, and better utilize our current spaces to deliver activities. So when I talk about our facilities, the, the 11 or so uh, multi-purpose facilities, some with gymnasiums, some without, although right now we could host the full Martin Luther King holiday celebration at the Martin Luther King Center, and the people have decorated it like, like a, a beautiful hall to have their wedding receptions, we need to expand upon that for other assemblies other types of performances and multi-purposes. And that's throughout all of our centers. Um, we, again, we have our swimming pools, and I often tell people, because again, running the Domain Center, and working with a population that was often underserved and did not have access, well, we had at that time, which is now uh, J. Lionel A. Bear Golf Course, it used to be Muni, the municipal golf course, it was like before there was Tiger Woods, I could tell you that I saw a number of young black kids who could swing a golf club pretty good. So Mike used to let us on the golf course on Mondays on the day it was closed and introduced them to greens and golf space that otherwise they would never be able to go and have access to. So it's about expanding our use yet again. And of course our swimming pool, um, you know, here in Lafayette, we could swim 10, almost 11 months out of the year, right? We really don't have winners like talking about it. We don't have to reserve our swimming, even our outdoor swimming, to two and a half months in what we call the summer. So we have to get to the point where we better utilize our facilities. But as I close my original, pre my initial presentation, my greatest vision of all, and, and I hope that we can achieve this as my time on the council is, is coming to a close, and part of this is partnering with David and, and Bayou Vermilion District and Vermilionville, and this is what I think CREATE delivers to us, and that's to start taking properties and facilities and creating joint purposes. So I have a vision, and I think by the end of this budget process, we're going to have a significant amount of seed money on our side. And I think once David is able to see that and show his board through his, his um, resources, they'll be able to match it. But we envision connecting Hyman Recreational Center and Park to Vermilionville in the Bayou Vermilion District. How about that? So, yeah. So, so starting on the Hyman Park side, 
we have a baseball field that, believe it or not, I used to once play baseball on. I see Phyllis is here, her husband. We had some great baseball times, didn't we? But it's no longer being used. And, and often when I used to go to uh, Festival International, I've actually been approached by people and say, Where, where's the diversity? And I'm talking about in the first 10 years, not in the last 10 years. It was, where, where's the diversity? Where is the, the access and the comfort of people wanting to come? And some of our visitors, some of our friends who's coming from other countries, in particular some of the African countries, they was looking for, as I would go to these backstages and into these hospitality areas, there was one, those first 10 years we were kind of absent, okay? Now we're doing so well with festival, I'm concerned that, that although downtown needs to always remain the primary stage, I have a vision that we could spread festival in other major tourist events throughout our city. Inclusive of the Horse Farm, the Holy Rosary property, in this vision that we have here for Vermilionville and Hyman Park. So I would like to repurpose that baseball field into a performance festival art stage. Similar to like the main stage in downtown, where you see the backstop, put us a nice concrete stage, leave the stadium lights up, and then utilize the river, which everyone knows our waterways are valuable. Utilize the river and truly create our first real true river walk in life again. How about that? With the, with the, with the, yes. With the, a true river walk, boat launch, the whole nine yards, but yet have a walking bridge that connects Hyman Park to the historical Vermilionville where we could visit these facilities, these activities, and these programs, and repurpose these two ballparks that's really doing nothing as well. Take these two ballparks on this side, and in partnership with Vermilionville in the Bayou Vermilion District, expand it. And then we could see um, uh, farmers markets, we could see pop-up shops, we could see uh, some culturally sensitive type eateries where, where you have the outdoor seating. I have seen a significant demand. People want to be able to walk onto a deck and eat on the river. I envision that. And I can tell you that with our budget process this year and with the conversations I have here, had with David, that I can truly see that coming to pass. So I'm excited and it's about expanding the use of our current spaces utilizing them to the best that we possibly can in bringing a tourist attraction into areas that historically have been neglected. So the future looks bright, the future of recreation is gonna be bright, and much of that is gonna be through the CREATE initiative. So at this time, David, why don't you follow up on that? Let me introduce uh, David again, uh, Executive Director of the Bayou Vermilion District in Vermilionville. Thank you. Thank you. Let's stand up for it. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Let me just uh, preface my remarks by saying that uh, I'm a proud graduate of UL, the Francophone Studies Doctor Program, but I'm more proud of being a graduate of the Barry L. Soleil, Zachary Richard and Richard Gidry School of Guerrilla Cultural Militancy. <laughs> um, get them when they're not looking kind of, kind of deal and just sneak, sneak culture into their back pocket and go, oh, what did I find here? Oh, it, it was there all along, quite frankly. And right, Kenneth, you're right. I remember we did have a, a long discussion not long before the flood. I said it's been over a year, so we had to do with other things there. But it is, I can tell you right now, that it is in our future plans uh, to build, uh, as a matter of fact, we're going to be building a watershed uh, uh, exhibit and uh, uh, what you call a laboratory. We're going to be testing the water and also being uh, teaching the young people about the, the importance of a clean watershed, of not polluting, of taking care of our environment. And we're also talking about building that food bridge across the, uh, the way we have that in. So we are already making plans of our to make that happen. And I'd love to see that, that uh, river walk frontway on that side across the line from us. I think that'd be, that'd be fantastic. But I like this <laughs> That's, that's in our future plans for sure. But I want to also dovetail with something else that Charles had up there on his board. Uh, that I've written down, I'm going to use that as my, uh, my guiding principles for, for, for the next few years, I guess. It says, saving a species is directly related to saving a habitat. And that's what Vermilionville is all about, quite frankly. This place was built back in the, uh, when I first, uh, in the 1990s, uh, April 1st, 1990, as a matter of fact. But it's something that started long before that, when Mr. Bob Cole, who was the president of the uh, uh, Lafayette Chamber of Commerce, 
had this vision to clean up the Bayou Vermilion because we had been declared as the most polluted, polluted waterway in the United States in the 1970s. And this is a time when rivers were catching fire in the United States, and we were the most polluted. Uh, Mr. Bobbs uh, knew that uh, we had the Tesh Vermilion Water District, which pumps water out of the Chafalaya and into the Vermilion River, and now we're actually kind of looking at ways that we can reverse that cycle, because it might be better for, for us, uh, especially in these coming days. Uh, to keep the water flowing, but we realized that there wasn't enough. We had to add a little something, so we created the Vermilion uh, the, uh, the District to uh, clean up the bayou, to restore uh, the, the natural uh, health to the bayou. And that's what we've been doing for the last uh, so many years. But also we realized that in our enabling legislation, we were created that we're also there to uh, create a new viable economic model along the bottom also. Because at that time, that's when uh, Paul Proudhon uh, burned his redfish, and that's when um, everybody, didn't nobody wanted to mess with my tutu -tut anymore, and everybody was kind of discouraged of discovering Cajun and Creole culture. And as somebody was saying earlier this morning, but as time went by, people were talking, when you heard about Louisiana, talking less and less about morals and more about, about Lafayette. And that's part of that same, uh, that, that same uh, vein of thinking also. And because of a place like the Universe, I'm very proud to host this event, because quite frankly, this place was literally built on that idea that we have this beautiful culture here, that we can uh, uh, use it as a cultural attraction, but also to nurture. Uh, somebody else was saying that, uh, was that we don't uh, teach uh, these traditional values and crafts and songs in, in, in the kitchen tables anymore. Now you have to go out to the, the to the different schools and whatnot. You know, I think the days are gone when you'll have a Michael Doucet, for example, whose picture is up here on the, on the wall, who became a world famous musician. I, well, how did you learn all those, those tunes? Well, you literally went to, to kitchen table to kitchen table and found all of these old uh, fiddle players and you learned all those tunes from those guys. Those guys are gone and try and catch up with Michael Doucet to learn a fiddle tune from him. Good luck, you know, uh, catching up with Mike these days. So we have places like Remainville now and the ACA uh, and, and LA Lafayette um, Parish School System where we teach all these different crafts and so, you know, have a, a new generation of new musicians coming up who you know how to read and uh, uh, music, have an ideas of musical theory but still they have uh, the, the feel and, and the grit and the understanding of what the old tunes were all about. They have this idea of the history behind it and that's what we try to teach here at Vermeer also the history about what a, a man like Wasek uh, Amduan you know, what he went through to learn how to, uh, to, to learn his music, you know, picking cotton and working in the fields and, and speaking Creole, or Nathan Abshire, whose, whose day job was the, not, uh, the guardian of a garbage dump. You know, but he was, he, that's what he did during the day, but in the, in this, on his side gig, he traveled the world <laughs> as, a, as an accordion player. Why? Because he could speak Cajun French, he play the music, he knew what was valuable about, the, about our culture. And here, in the, especially in this place right here, this is one of the last, and, and Pud, uh, if you're still here, correct me if I'm wrong, this is really one of the last traditional dance halls that you'll see, like uh, we have also here with a couple of pictures by Mr. Philip Gould, at the Blue Moon, um, uh, that, yeah, that's the Blue Moon, but it was in New Iberia at that time, it was a place, an old time dance hall. And I grew up knowing the dance halls like that, or also the Hamilton Club, which was one of the last great Zydeco clubs. I closed down that So there those places aren't around much anymore. But here in Greenville, we have our traditional Bobby Dimanche every Sunday. Uh, we try to perpetuate that tradition. We have the Cajun uh, Zydeco bands, and every quarter we have a swamp pop band that comes play also, because the swamp pop is another type of indigenous music that we have here in South Louisiana. People kind of forget that's kind of making it a comeback. So we're here not only to, to bring in visitors from all over the world, and believe me when I tell you that. We have visitors from France here every day. I'm not exaggerating. We have people from France in this village every day. If it's in January, cold, rainy, we have two people in the village that come through, it's a couple from France. I can, I can guarantee you that. So French is very much important in talking about the um, importance of hiring French speakers. I hire as many tour guides and French speakers and you people in the back office who don't necessarily need to speak French, to do their jobs, but I you know, encourage them to use it as much as possible, uh, to hire those people when, they're, uh, when they have all the other qualifications necessary, they can speak French, I will take them for sure, because it does help create this ambiance in this place where you know, French is a living uh, language, it's not just to, to, 
to show off just friend, big friends just to speak French. They use it in their daily lives, they use it in that kind of work. So that's just my opening remarks and we'll be a little more details. But uh, that's all I want to say. Here in Vermeerville, like I said, we're very proud to host you here because this place was built on this very idea that Create is now continuing to, to take into the next, uh, to the next uh, century. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from the Lafayette Parish Public Library uh, Director, Ms. Teresa Emerson. First, I want to go back in time and give you an idea of what the library system was like in the year 2000. We had a one store, a, a main library in Lafayette, that was it. It was a two story uh, building, and we rented small spaces uh, in Lafayette, Karen Road, Busan, Milton, Scott, Youngsville, and Broussard, all the municipalities around. But with the support of the citizens of Lafayette Parish, the library passed a new dedicated property tax back in 2002. And also with that, a bond issue, approved a bond issue where we could sell bonds to uh, have construction money. Fast forward to 2017. This is what adequate funding can do for a community. Right now we have a totally renovated main library with an additional third floor that's open to the public. We have meeting rooms, study rooms, a children's department with a story time room and a crafts room a cafe, a teen area, genealogy space, a drive through window, and makerspace technology studio. We also have an international thing. We, we took off on the downtown international festival, and our children's um, uh, department, if you've ever been into it, is an international village. We now have another library in Lafayette on the south side, and it also has, there, there wasn't any service in 2002 in South Lafayette. The population was there, but we had no way to build a building. It has meeting rooms, study rooms, children's department, story time room, craft room, teen space, cafe, drive through window, and a make space uh, area. Its theme is the Vermilion River. If you've ever walked in there, you may not have noticed, but there's actually a river going to the children's department. It's a camp. We want you to camp on the river and enjoy the Cypress Theater in the children's department. We can watch a puppet show. And we have trees and a possum hanging from the tree. And we have a fishing deck. So it was meant to be as part of our culture, the Vermilion River that runs through our area and goes to, to, through that area and through another parish. We also uh, built a new library in the community of Karen Crow, uh, that's next to their community uh, center there in Karen Crow. It also has meeting rooms, and we're talking about small libraries that didn't have anything. They had books. There was no place to have a, a meeting or a program. There was no dedicated little teen or children's services. That now has a meeting room, study rooms, children's department, story time room, genealogy area, a drive-thru window, and this replaced the old little bitty library in an older building on St. Anne Street. This is what your money's doing. This is a new library that's serving the Broussard and the uh, Youngsville area. It also has meeting rooms, study rooms, children's department. It has all those things in the drive through window. It replaced those uh, small facilities that, Youngsville, and, that were in uh, Youngsville and Broussard. This is our Chenier Center Library. It's in Building C. We're, right now, it's closed. We're renovating that, that uh, facility right now. It was a 15-year-old facility. We're giving it a facelift on, on our dime. Um, it's been closed for two weeks. We're going to be closed next week. They're finishing up the carpet, but we painted the entire uh, library. We put in new carpet. We installed new lighting. So now you can actually read the spines of the books. It's pretty dark in there. And we just totally updated it. I'm updating the children's department. And that's uh, about 3,100 square feet, and it's going to look brand new. I bought a bin this week and it really sparkles. So we can't wait to open that up September 5th. I think we're going to open it up. We're going to have all of our new furniture in, um, but it will be in, and we hope to have a rededication about mid September on that. The Doosan Library, I don't know if any of you have been to Doosan, it's a small community. The, the library there was. Next, uh, I think there's no fire. It, it actually moved. It was a little room and a little house, and then it moved to uh, 
next to the fire station. But they built a new community serve, uh, community uh, center with some money that they got from the federal government. And we built a library, or took that, uh, one of the dedicated spaces in that community center and made it a new library. So it's about the same size, but it's brand new. It's across the street from the elementary school. So it's given us visibility in that community. And um, you know we've added a lot, been able to add services. We were able to add it and wire it so that we can have uh, computers. And we still have our Milton facility. It's a rented space, um, and we're going to be working next year on getting some updates done to that. This is our Scott Library, which is on the main thoroughfare of Scott, and I'll have more about that in just a minute. Then this is our Butler Memorial Library in the Martin Luther King Rec Center. Uh, this facility serves the neighborhoods in North Lafayette, and we'll probably be doing some updates for that uh, this next year, too. And then our jewel, current jewel in the system is our West Regional Library. Uh, we have a con construction project in place. This is a totally uh, $8 million project with $5.3 million of that going to construction. Uh, they just started the work in late July. The, the contractor's uh, contract started July uh, 25th. This facility is in Scott on the corner of, oh, well, there's not really a corner there yet, but there will be, uh, Old Spanish Trail and Apollo Road. And that facility will replace the small Scott uh, facility. So we hope to have that open at the end of 2018 or the very beginning of 2019. And again, it's going to have everything, a lot more meeting rooms, uh, uh, study rooms, children's department, story time room, teen room, uh, major space. And the theme for this children's department is going to be automobiles and, and transportation because it's on a major I-10 Old Spanish Trail, part of that history, that area, and uh, not going to concentrate on trains because trains have already been done in Scott, but just the transportation uh, and movement of, of people through that corridor on the Old Spanish Trail. And then, and like I said, we're going to uh, update our Milton and uh, Butler branch uh, branches next year. And after a 20-year absence, if they approve the budget, we'll put it in Bookmobile on the road. Yeah, so we're really uh, thrilled with that. So, you know, people ask me what I'm most proud of with our library system, and I'm most proud. It's taken us a while to build these buildings, but we did have adequate funding to do it. But I'm most proud that we've been able to add to our staff, because it does take staff to run these buildings. And we provided over 2,000 programs last year just with the staff that we had. 2,233 programs is what we turned into the state and federal government as our programming. Uh, all of our facilities uh, provide Wi-Fi and high-speed internet, the highest we can possibly buy, and we have 300 computers. We also have books. I forgot to mention we do have books still. <laughs> <laughs> and DVDs, yeah, really. Yeah. Blu-rays, console games, you check out PS4 games, Wii games. Because like Greg said, if you're not changing and growing, you're dying. And the libraries have had to face that within the last 20 years. And the, Parish uh, funding has been there to help us grow. And it's still there. We talk about our savings. Well, that savings there, if we don't have it, we can't go forward into the next 20 years or the next 17 years um, with our services. So our library system is already doing so many of these create initiatives. Our programs, we have programs that explore culture, our history. We archive that information. We have a local history collection. The genealogists come from around the, the world to do genealogy in our libraries. We have the resources. We supply your recreational pursuits of reading, gaming, crafts. We, we have a virtual reality uh, thing that's free. People can use our virtual reality programs. Uh, we have genealogists, like I said, that's your recreational pursuit for gene genealogy. We supply entertainment. We bring in authors, performers. We open our meeting rooms to other organizations that also bring on their own dime, other performers and uh, uh, programs free of charge. Everything we do is free. You pay it to the backside with your taxes, but we don't charge for anything we have. We promote the arts with our displays, our programs, our makerspace uh, technologies, and our 3D printing, and our creation space. Uh, we, we sponsor local authors, local writing workshops, that kind of thing. That's part of our culture, too, is the writing and, and the, the history of this area. 
tourism. We have a lot of tourists that come to the library. When they come downtown and when they come to Lafayette, a lot of times they have their own libraries in their own community and they want to see what Lafayette does. And it says a lot for the community when we have take pride in our libraries because they want to see, you know, you put, where, do you, where does the community invest their money? And they're always impressed when they see what we've done in this community with our library system and how uh, it's better than a lot of their systems. Um, we also have family members that come around. They, they bring their family members to the library. So we get a lot of word of mouth about how great our system is. We also support our economy, once again, part of CREATE. Um, we want people to live here, and to live here, they, it's true, they don't look at roads and bridges and drainage. They start looking at the price of housing, the schools, the park system, and the libraries. So we are a successful partner in CREATE, and when the library does something, when we pass a millage, it gets national attention. You may not see it, but the journals, the library journals that are around the, around the world report on whether our millages get, you know, uh, passed, by how much they got passed, uh, they were passed by. And so we do, uh, you know, we are on somebody's radar. We, people that want to move here, they, they, they look. And we know that because we are oftentimes mistaken by for Louisiana, Colorado, and Louisiana, I mean uh, Lafayette, Colorado, and Lafayette, Indiana. And we get we you know, Lafayette's a common name. So we know those people are looking at, at Lafayette. So we aren't just folks, we're not just for kids, um, we're, we're just for everybody here in the community. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we want to open up to questions at this time. If someone has a question. Um, and, and I would like to first um, offer one to Teresa because I know one of the greatest challenges is when you're doing so much, when you're so, uh, I guess, progressive in nature, trying to stay ahead of the curve. What do you find may be one of the greatest challenges in the future for the public library system? Tough question. <laughs> Well, I have a lot of staff, and we're just always busy looking at what the next uh, trend is, how we can support. We're constantly trying to make partnerships because we can't provide everything. We provide a lot, but I mean, we're talking infants to, to senior citizens. We've got a lot of programs, and so it's just trying to keep up, network, so that we're not presenting that we're, we've got other people, other partners uh, coming in and helping us do what we need to do. So it's not just our staff. We're out there in the community and, and partnering with other organizations. Great, great. Um, again, we, we are open to questions. Anyone may have a question, I think, right here. When? Jackie, right here. I'm not, yeah, I was, but then I'll leave that to the constable. So, from the standpoint of a person who spent a lot of time in our community in the performing arts world, um, for both the library and for the recreation department, um, I would just like to encourage you all both to give consideration as you build out new facilities, to include performance spaces that are a little more formal than the performance spaces that exist now in the libraries and also to really make that a priority in the recreation facilities. Because you know, once you're building a building, of course, performing arts spaces are expensive, but once you've got the roof and the foundation and the electrical and the plumbing in place, you've crossed some of the, the territory. And in my work, one of the big challenges has been, that, oh, this space is great, but we, we don't have enough room for it on the stage. We don't have the technical lighting that we need and no, we can't bring it in because there's no place to anchor it. So those are some of the, the discussions that we would love to be a part of as new facilities are planned or as new facilities, our old existing facilities are um, modified and renovated. How can we do that just a little bit more? And if you, you, in my opening, and I think that was one of the things that I put emphasis on, as well as the libraries, how do we use the space we have better? And as we build out our new facilities, 
how do we make sure that we are multi-purpose in nature, that we're not limiting ourselves to, to, to a sports court, that it can expand into something greater? Any more questions? I know this panel isn't that good, huh? <laughs> Any more questions? Um, I, I would like to say from the previous presentation, there was a lot of question about French and, and the utilization of French and the purpose that French serves. And I, I'm gonna just say something very personal to maybe give you an idea of how important it is. My kids participated in French immersion up until the eighth grade because they had to go to Northside High School. There wasn't an option they couldn't go to that. <laughs> so um, now if, if we do what I envision in education where we have all services everywhere, that wouldn't have been a problem. They had to go to Northside. But I can tell you, I got a son now at Morehouse College in his second year, and he's a double major, political science and French, double major. And he took two French courses in two semesters. He did very, very well. But it also created an opportunity for him to teach a French class to incoming freshmen this past summer, as well as he was given an invitation to study abroad after his freshman year. So when you talk about French, and that was only up until the eighth grade, but when you talk about the immersion program and just French in general and, and preserving a heritage and a culture, it's, it's reward, it's greater than anyone could stand here and measure. Okay, we can only talk about what we have experienced or known, but I can tell you it's even greater than that. And maybe something that we incorporate into our libraries. As you know, you know, might even look at doing something there. So I just wanted to add that. David, again, I guess the challenge is kind of like the library system when you're really aggressive in what you're trying to do in here at, 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 at uh, Vermilionville. Uh, the services and the offerings have been great. Sometimes when you stay ahead of the curve, it's like, what do we plan for next? We talked about the partnership, and I'm really looking forward. I think that's going to be a tremendous economic feature for this community, this area, and Lafayette as a whole. But looking into your future, what is the next step for Vermilionville, especially now with this CREATE initiative that is available? I love the idea of preserving these original type dance hall with these types of floors and this type of facility as opposed to a nightclub setting. What is your next big step? Well, our, our next step is, is still in the same lines of what I think the original uh, idea of, you know, for me and Bill was, it, it, we got a lot of criticism in the beginning. I think right so is that it was just too Cajun centric that we didn't pay much attention to the, enough attention to the Creole aspect of it. I think in the last few years, uh, we have you know, brought the Creole uh, aspect into the culture much more, but also we need to remember that there's a third uh, leg of this tripod, and that's the Native American aspect, because we're literally sitting, standing wherever, on a site that has been, humans have inhabited for probably 10,000 years. Okay, you, uh, Paul Grove's uh, middle school across the way was Paul Grove, Paul Grove High School. Uh, the principal at the time would actually give like a quarter or five cents to every arrowhead the kids would, would uh, dig up, if you, if you go to the Natural History Museum right now, uh, Science Museum rather, uh, you know, there are boxes and boxes and boxes of arrowheads and pottery shards. Uh, Shard West Springs was a natural uh, source of, of fresh water until, uh, until the flood of 27, the dam off the HFY that cut off that fresh source. So we know that the Native Americans who taught us how to survive in this hostile environment, quite frankly, uh, uh, were here long before us. Uh, so we, our next step is to expand that part of our uh, of our offerings. Uh, and we, we start building in the back behind the Broussard House, the Amo Broussard House, which is our oldest and most uh, historically significant building, uh, under the uh, leadership also I said, of Brady McKell, who has helped us push that uh, forward. We're going to have some Native American uh, structures and a Native American uh, ceremonial site. Uh, we've also been working with some of the Native tribes uh, around here. Uh, to expand that and also to expand that horizon and more of our cultural offerings here at the meeting. We'll also be working with, um, like I said, the LPSS. Uh, we're going to be doing projects with, where dance is going to be incorporated into the, some of the lessons planned. Uh, we're going to work a lot with the French immersion students for uh, social studies, doing that in French, so expanding upon uh, that idea of, of what Charles said. And another thing that I wrote down also, I will not leave French on the school grounds. Uh, so when I get to leave French in the school grounds, we're going to make it a living, uh, breathing language outside. So that's pretty much what we plan on. It does mean more of an, uh, uh, 
uh, an educational center for locals. I guess you say all still are remaining as, as a tourist attraction for visitors that come from, from wherever, from France, the Pika Kansas, or wherever. If you want to learn about our Cajun and Creole culture here. Excellent. Well, although our session did start a little late, my job was to get us back on time, and it's 3.15, so our time is up. But would you please help me join in congratulating and thanking this panel? Just, as you can see by our combination and our performance, if ever you need great leadership, just call up Teresa David or myself and you got it. <laughs>